Welcome back to episode 21 of our Music Theory Podcast. Last episode, we continued investigating the early Baroque period by talking about opera in some depth. We talked about how it was sort of a culmination of all sorts of different artistic endeavors. That's one of the reasons why it was so popular. We talked about the concepts of recitative and aria, where recitative advances the storyline and the aria is where emotions are laid out to bear. And we looked at our first example of an aria with the coronation of Popea by Claudio Monteverdi. Today we're going to look at Henry Purcell and his opera Dido and Aeneas before we continue on to think about the rise of instrumental music during this early Baroque period. So, let's jump in and start off with Henry Purcell, who lived from 1659 to 1695, less than 40 years. Italy was the undisputed leader in music throughout the 17th century. However, music also flourished in France, Germany, or what is now known as Germany, and other countries, always under Italian influence. The greatest English composer of the Baroque era was Henry Purcell, who was also the organist at Westminster Abbey and a member of the Chapel Royal, like several other mem members of his family. In his short lifetime, he wrote sacred, instrumental, and theater music, as well as 29 welcome songs for his royal masters. Purcell combined a respect for native traditions, represented by the music of William Byrd, Thomas Wilkes, and others, with a lively interest in the more adventurous French and Italian music of his own time. He wrote and published the first English examples of a new Italian genre, the Sonata. So let's discuss his opera, Dido and Aeneas, which premiered in 1689. Though Purcell wrote a good deal of music for the London Theatre, his one true opera was Dido and Aeneas, and it was performed at a girls' school, though there may have been an earlier performance at court as well that we're not sure about. The whole thing lasts little more than an hour and contains no virtuoso singing roles at all. Dido and Aeneas is an exceptional work then and a miniature but it is also a work of rare beauty and dramatic power. Rarer still, it is a great opera in English, perhaps the only great opera in English prior to the 20th century. So let's talk about Purcell's background and the background of the opera. Purcell's source was the Aeneid the noblest of all Latin epic poems, poems written by Virgil to celebrate the glory of Rome and the Roman Empire. It tells the story of the city's foundation by the Trojan prince Aeneas, who escapes from Troy when the Greeks capture it with their wooden horse. After many adventures and travels, Aeneas finally reaches Italy, guided by the firm hand of Jove, king of the gods. In one of the Aeneid's most famous episodes, Aeneas and the widow Queen Dido of Carthage fall deeply in love, but Jove tells the prince to stop dallying and get on with his important journey. Regretfully, he leaves, and Dido kills herself, an agonizing suicide as Virgil describes it. In Acts 1 and 2 of the opera, Dido expresses apprehension about her feelings for Aeneas, even though her courtiers keep encouraging the match in chorus after chorus. Next, we see the plotting of some witches who, for malicious reasons of their own, make Aeneas believe that Jove is ordering his departure. 
The witches are a highly unvirgilian touch, but ever since Shakespeare's Macbeth, witches have been popular with English theater goers, perhaps especially with school aged ones. Finally, in Act 3, Aeneas tries feebly to excuse himself. Dido spurns him in a furious recitative. As he leaves, deserting her, she prepares for her suicide. So during the recitative that we're going to hear, Dido addresses this regal, somber recitative to her confidant, Belinda. Notice the imperious tone as she tells Belinda to take her hand and the ominous setting of the word darkness. Purcell even contrives to suggest a kind of tragic irony when Dido's melodic line turns to the major mode on the word welcome in death is now a welcome guest. The opera's final aria, usually known as Dido's Lament, is built over a slow ground bass or ostinato, as we spoke about two podcasts ago. A descending bass line with chromatic semitones repeated a dozen times. The bass line sounds mournful even without accompaniment, as in measures one to four. Violins in the string orchestra imitate this line while Dido is singing, and especially after she is stopped. As often happens in arias, the words are repeated a number of times. Dido has little to say, but much to feel, and the music needs time to convey the emotional message. We experience an extended emotional tableau. Whereas recitative makes little sense unless the listener understands the exact words, with arias, a general impression of them may be enough. Indeed, even that is unnecessary when the melody is as poignant as Purcell is here. The most heartbreaking place comes twice on the exclamation, ah, where the bass note D, harmonized with a major mode chord during the first six appearance, appearances of the ground bass, is shadowed by a new minor chord, as we see here. Finally, there's the chorus. The last notes of this great aria run into a wonderful final chorus. We are to imagine a slow dance as groups of sorrowful cupids, first graders perhaps, file past the buyer. Now Dido's personal grief is transmitted into a communal sense of mourning. In the context of the whole opera, this chorus seems even more meaningful because the courtiers who sing it have matured so much since the time they were thoughtlessly and cheerfully urged Dido to give in to her love. The general style of the music is that of the magical, imitative polyphony and homophony with some word painting. The first three lines are mostly imitative, the last one homophonic but Purcell's style clearly shows the inroads of functional harmony and of the definite, unified rhythms that had been developed in the 17th century. There is no mistaking this touching chorus for an actual Renaissance magical. Like Dido's Lament, with drooping wings is another emotional tableau, and this time the emotion spills over to the opera audience. As the courtiers grieve for Dido, we join them in responding to Dido's tragedy. Please enjoy the Act 3 finale of Dido and Aeneas. Dear 
what a powerful piece of music. You really could feel the pain that Dido was going through during her lament. So we'll leave it there for today. You know, we try to keep these around 20 minutes, and I think to jump into instrumental music would take far longer or just wouldn't be worth our time. So next episode, we're going to start looking at the rise of instrumental music and Arcangelo Corelli, the composer, and one of his works. Before finishing up uh, early music with African ostinatos. So we'll see you again real soon. Cheers. <laughs>